All right, everybody, we're going to go ahead and get going, try to catch us back up. Some folks like to talk a little long, okay, and I might be one of them, I don't know, all right? Um, my name is Cam Pan. I'm the new cotton specialist here at the University of Georgia. I started uh, almost a year ago, okay, so I'm really excited to be here today. Glad we're in person, see everybody this time, um, you know, excited to be working for you guys. A couple things I want to make you aware of, if you weren't in the first sessions, um, we do have pesticide credits, okay, they're at the registration desk. I, I believe it's two hours for commercial and one hour private, okay. Um, just wanted to make you guys aware of that. And then uh, me and Dr. Snyder are going to split this. He's a whole lot smarter than I am, so stick around for his one, okay. So, if you've heard this talk before, it's fairly similar to what I've done at county meetings also. But, imagine with me, I know it's kind of early in the morning, okay. And you, if you got a biscuit out there, it was a pretty good biscuit, right? But I mean, we're all looking forward to lunch by now, right? And so just imagine with me if whenever we sit down at lunch, a plate like this is put in front of you, okay? Lindsay says it looks pretty good. Yeah, I think it does too. That's a Dr. Philip Roberts special, okay? Pick some fresh collards out the garden, some roasted carrots. I mean, it's looking good, right? And if you know Dr. Roberts, you know he's a big duck hunter, okay? So whenever he sent me this picture, I just assume that that right there is a duck breast, okay? And if it were a duck breast, it'd probably be the most perfectly cooked duck breast I believe I've ever seen, all right? It's really easy to overcook duck. It'll dry it out, all that good stuff. But that is perfectly done right there, all right? But I'm using this as an illustration, all right? That what you see isn't always what you get, okay? You see, it was a slow day in the duck blind for Dr. Roberts, and an unfortunate crow flew over, okay? So he said, well, I'm gonna shoot that crow, and he did. And he waited until his wife went out of town, and he cleaned it, and he cooked it up. And he played it up on that plate, it looked beautiful, right? Beautiful. And if he were in here, I'd ask him, I'd say, Dr. Roberts, what did that crow taste like? And he would tell me it tasted like a lead pipe. And he threw the whole plate away. I mean, didn't eat a single thing else. He took one bite of the crow and threw it all away. All right? What you see isn't always what you get. You see, at the end of a cotton season, you see a lot of pictures like this, right? Good friend of mine up in Midville, Georgia, Anthony Black. I'm sure many of you know who that is. He sent me this picture, and he was bragging, man. He was bragging. He made some cotton, didn't he? It looks really good, right? Just because it looks good don't mean it is, right? You don't know what you get until it goes through the gym, okay? Another type of picture that folks like to take is something with a drone like this. Seth McAllister is here today. He took this picture for me. And this is of our variety trial there in Plains, all right? A couple things I want to point out here. One of the varieties in the variety trial this year was one that was extremely showy, okay? Bright white, open all the way to the top. Beautiful cotton, beautiful. That's here on the right side of the slide, okay? But if you look at that strip through the field there, don't look so good, right? It was tough to defoliate, the leaves may have stuck a little bit, and I mean, you don't see very much white in that variety there, okay? That variety is the one that won the trial, okay? The one that looked great finished about middle of the pack, okay? So what you see isn't always what you get, all right? I just want to talk about that for a second before I get into varieties, okay? There are two main types of variety trials that are conducted at the University of Georgia, and the first one I want to talk about is our OVT program, all right? They have the ability to do something that I could never do, and that's evaluate a lot of varieties in fewer locations than I do, but they're able to look at far more than I ever could. They looked at 54 this past year, and I only did 12, okay? They did it in about six locations, dry land, irrigated, so on and so forth. But I like to use this as a resource to compare our industry standards to some of the new releases that are coming out this season, okay? And so these are the varieties in our OBT program that yielded above the OBT average, all right? Our OBT average was just over 1,500 pounds, all right? They did really well this year, okay? A lot of varieties on this slide Almost all of the varieties that were in the on-farm variety trial program are listed here, okay? 
But there's a few that I want to spend a couple minutes on, and those are the new releases for 2022, okay? 5 411, next gen 3299, installable 4595, all right? Whenever it's time to start putting in seed orders and all that good stuff, and somebody brings up one of these new varieties, you know that, hey, it did well in Georgia in 2021, okay? Now, one other variety that's not listed on this slide, it was included in a smaller subset um, in the OVT program, and that's the only reason it's not on here, was Delphine 2239, okay? Um, it's a new variety coming out in 22. It did very well in the trial that it was in, but the only reason it's not on here is because um, it was not included in the big trial, okay? So next we'll move on to the on-farm program, okay? We did 25 locations this past time, all the way from far southwest Georgia up to Burke County and even as far north as Oconee County, all right? We had a lot of locations. We're able to evaluate these varieties in a wide range of yield environments, okay? And we had 12 varieties this time, and those are listed on the left side of this slide, okay? I'm a big basketball fan. I like automatic bids, okay? So the first automatic bid is the most planted variety in the previous year. That, of course, was 1646. It's still the most planted variety in 2020. And then uh, the trial winner, which was Dynagro 3799. Outside of that, I get in touch with my industry friends like Sean, uh, and I say, hey, send me your, your varieties that you want in the trial, and that's how these are chosen, okay? They're managed using grower practices, replicated in large plots, and then we take a seed cotton sample from each variety, gin it here in Tifton at the microgen, and get realistic turnout and fiber quality values, okay? So these are the results for 2021, all right? We've got our variety there on the left, link yields next to that, statistics beside that. Just a couple minutes on statistics. Um, whenever you see a B right there next to Stonewall 51, if another variety has a B next to it, that means it's statistically similar, even though the numbers may not exactly add up. Okay, so Armour 9831 would be statistically similar to Stonewall 59. Okay, and then uh, in, in each trial, I looked at the varieties that yielded above the location average, and I can calculate that into a percent. I use that to determine variety stability over these wide range of environments. Okay. So for example, Dynagro 3615 won the trial this year at 1,294 pounds. It was in our top yielding group and yielded above the trial average 84% of the time. Okay, that's kind of what all that means, all right? What, what do I see from this, all right? Kind of same story, different day, right? For the past three years, the Dynagro varieties have won the variety trial. They've been doing really well across a wide range of environments in the state of Georgia. The bolded varieties, that's our top yielding group, okay? So... With that, this is kind of the big table that everybody's used to, right? This is available on the UGA Cotton Team website, all right? UGACotton.com. I don't want to spend forever and a day on this because this is a very busy table. But a couple of things, we've got it separated out into locations. The yellow is <coughs> dry land, the blue is irrigated. I highlighted the varieties that yielded above the location average green. Why green, right? Green means go. I'm good with planting a variety that yields above average, okay? Another thing that I did, there's a red line about in the middle of this chart, and that separates the low yielding or the below average yielding locations and the above average yielding locations. Our average in the variety trial this time was 1,192 pounds, so from Sumter down was below the trial average, and from Ben Hill up was above the trial average. Now, why do I do that? Okay, you guys know your fields and what you need better than anybody. Okay. If you've got a field that you know historically is a below average yielding location, hey, maybe let's pay attention to these trials over here. We can kind of tease out what you need, maybe a variety. is going to do better in a lower yielding environment than it would in a higher yielding environment over here. Okay, like I said, that's all available at ugacotton.com. Okay, last thing on the variety trial, um, these are averaged over the past two years. Mm -hmm. Thanks for doing it. Okay. All right. Yeah, that sounds good. Um, over the past two years, these are averaged here. Um, was that? Oh, it don't matter. Either way. So, uh, you're good, John. Um, this average over the past two years, there were nine varieties that were the same over those two years. Okay, so that's why there's only nine varieties listed on this slide. Again, there's 49 locations. All right. So, again, kind of same story. Dynagrows are at the top, but 
In our top yielding group this time, we have Delta Pine 2038, whenever you average it across the two years. Good yielding variety, right, but it's not exactly what we expect in terms of quality. It's more in the base range, and you're, you're not really going to get a premium uh, out of that variety, all right? So that's kind of a good transition into my next topic here. Uh, whenever I started this position, I started to hear rumblings that people were going to start mixing cottonseed varieties, okay? And, you know, whenever I talk to a couple people, the logic adds up, right? People have done this before. Um, it's out there, you know. Generally, uh, their previous research has shown that it doesn't really work. But, hey, these are new varieties, different times, right? So I decided to throw in about six trials and look at this. The idea is they were mixing 1646 and 2038, all right? The logic is you get higher quality with 1646. It's a good yielder, but it falls over. And then with 2038, it is a little bit higher yielding than 1646, the base quality that we've already talked about, but that upright growth habit could potentially prop up uh, the 1646, all right? So the idea is you get the best of both worlds, right? Logic adds up, kind of makes sense, okay? So. Don't want to bore you guys to death. I know it's early in the morning with a lot of data, but in terms of yield, we did this across four locations, or six locations, excuse me, I need to change that. Um, there were no differences in yield, all right? You're looking at about 30 pounds of difference, whether you plant one of the varieties by themselves or mix them together. And we did a one-to-one -one mix using a red solo cup in a five-gallon bucket, okay? That's all we did. We also looked at the alternating rows, and it didn't make a difference either, all right? In terms of quality, sure. We saw differences in length and uniformity, okay? But at the end of the day, does that affect your bottom dollar, all right? So I looked at loan value for each one of the treatments, and the answer is no. It does not affect your bottom dollar. You're not making more money from mixing varieties than you are in planting either one by itself, okay? And then in terms of comparison to other commercially available varieties, there are in, we included this in a couple locations with our variety trial. And there were five other commercially available varieties that yielded similar to the mixture, but you get a guaranteed quality out of that, okay? And it's more likely to be in that premium range. So at the end of the day, mixing seeds seems like a little bit of a hassle. Growers have enough problems as it is. Um, I wouldn't worry with it, okay? Who here has heard about the new Thrive On technology? Anybody? Yeah, there's a handful, okay. So this is a new BT technology coming from Bayer, all right? It has no activity on caterpillar pests. It targets thrips and plant bugs, okay? On plant bugs, a little iffy, okay? Might help, might not. We gotta figure that out, all right? It is not a silver bullet like BT was against tobacco bug worm, okay, for plant bugs. Now for thrips, that's a different story. It's a real deal on thrips. It works really well. Dr. Roberts has been working with this technology for the past six years and says he has never seen an instance in the state of Georgia where he would recommend spray on thrips if this technology were present. All right. This technology is eventually coming in Delpine next year and Dynagro and Armour Varieties, and I had the opportunity to do a little bit of variety work with this technology. I just want to make you guys aware of that. Okay. So on the left side of this slide are two of our known varieties. Right? We got 1646 and 2038. Know what we're getting out of that. Okay, and then on the right hand side are new varieties with Thrive On technology. All right, you got Delpine 2131 and 2211. Okay, that is the new abbreviation for this technology, B3TXF. Eddie, y'all need to work on shortening that stuff up. Okay, it's a little too confusing with all these letters. Okay, B3 stands for Bolgard 3, T stands for Thrive On, and the XF is your Stenflex technology. All right, statistically, no. There wasn't any difference in the yield of these varieties, okay? But whenever you look at it, the highest yielder is an old and booty good. 1646, right? Still a good variety, good choice for us, all right? We have options out there right now. Um, these Thrive On varieties will not be available for purchase this time. They're coming, you know, in the next year or two. Um, but I just want to make you guys aware, hey, we're looking at it. You know, these are the genetic, this is the genetic potential of these varieties. I'm not up here to say, hey, we don't need to be treating thrips or anything like that, okay? I'm just here to tell you, these are the relative yield of these varieties, the genetic potential compared to some of our own standards in Georgia, all right? Okay, so about a year ago, I started and people said, man, there's a lot of buzz on this wide row stuff, all right? So I decided 
you know, I called up Dr. Snyder and I said, man, I said, I think we need to do something like this. And he said, okay, that sounds good. And so, um, you know, there's a lot of popular press out there. A lot of our friends in the Mid-South are doing this and they say that they're having great success, okay? And it kind of makes sense, right? We know that cotton has the ability to compensate for empty space, okay? You know, whenever you've got a gap in your stand or something, you've got to make a decision on whether you're going to replant or not and take into account, hey, that plant is going to put out these vegetative branches here and fill that space, convert that energy into bowls and land and so on and so forth, right? So the idea is you can reduce your seed costs. That's the number one goal of this system is to save on inputs, okay? It can increase airflow through the canopy, potentially helping with foliar diseases and bowl rot, maybe. And then also it can decrease moisture competition within the crop itself, hopefully reducing the number of irrigation events or, you know, reducing the amount of stress in a dry land type environment. But the question is, you know, all my friends in the Mid-South say it works. And I said, well, does it work in Georgia, right? That's what we need to know. So all we did was we looked at four row spaces, a single variety, 1646, okay? We did our 36 inch rows because that's still, that's the most common row space in the all right? 48 inches, Dr. Steve Brown over at Auburn, he started looking at that. I said, man, he's a smart man. I look up to him a lot. I say, he might have something figured out that I don't. So that's why I decided to include that one. 60 inches, that's what our friends in the Mid-South are doing, okay? But it makes sense for them. They're growing 30-inch corn and beans, okay? You skip every other plant box, boom, you got a 60-inch row, okay? And then that's why I threw in the 72-inch rows as well. For us, if you skip every other hot box on a 36-inch planter, Boom, you get 72 inch rows. Okay? Here's a couple of pictures that I took at the end of the year. 36 inch cotton looks pretty good. Will, it looked pretty good, didn't it? Will was there. 48 inch looks pretty good too. Okay? But whenever you get to the wide row, you can see visually there's more bowls on these plants, right? I mean, it looks better. Okay? So, and we did count the bowls. There were more bowls per plant out there on the wide row spaces. Okay, and this just illustrates the same thing, all right? You're making more cotton on a linear foot in a wider row, all right? And it's because there's more bowls on those planes, okay? 36 inch and 48 inch was about the same in that cotton sack there. 60 inch was a little bit more, and 72 inch you couldn't even fit in one bag, okay? Will mowed those rows down and he said, man, I hated doing that. He said, that stuff looked good. And I said, yeah, it really did. but does it make a difference on an acre, right? you got to look at this in terms of a land acre, okay? The short of it is no, right? Okay, we did accomplish our goal, reduced our seed cost 45 to 52% in our 60 and 72 inch rows, but, and that's all good and great, but whenever you sacrifice two to 500 pounds of land, that's not so great, right? In terms of bowl rot, we did count rot and hard lot bowls uh, in these treatments, and there was no difference with our wider row spaces, right? You saw six to nine percent bowl rot regardless of row space. Okay. <coughs> one thing I want to stress this is only one year worth of data. We're going to do this again just to confirm these results, but it may not be the silver bullet that some folks are looking for. Okay. Last thing I want to talk about is PGR time and rate. You know, pitch been around since the 60s and 70s, right? It's a product, it's one of the most consistent products in the market. It does what it's supposed to do as long as you get it on there and it doesn't get washed off, okay? But some of the questions that I get, well, when do you get the most bang for your buck? Do late applications do anything? When do I initiate shin, shin high, knee high, waist high? And uh, what rate do I use? And then some people say, well, I've heard a plant can't take up more than 24 ounces to the acre. And also, 24 ounces to the acre is the maximum single use rate according to the pig slate. Okay, just FYI. And then, of course, timeliness is key. I think that's something we don't talk about enough with pigs. If I called up Dr. Roberts or Dr. Culpepper or Dr. Kimmelite and said, well, what's the key to successful pest management in cotton or any other crop, they would say timeliness. All right? I think it's the same for, with pigs. We just don't talk about it as much. All right? So this is a little study I did just across the road here. That's our brag patch, right, where we high fertility ground, consistent three bell yield environment, all right? I did it on a variety that I would consider non-responsive to PGRs, and that is Dine Grow 3799, all right? A little tougher to manage that variety. So what I did was I sprayed these rates from zero to 24 ounces per acre one time, okay? 
and the timings were at Pinhead Square, first bloom, and third week of bloom. All right? First thing I want to point out, peak bloom treatments. One single application at peak bloom didn't do anything, right? Once the plant is this tall, you ain't shrinking it, okay? The only way to shorten that plant up when it's about this tall is to pull out a mower, all right? You ain't going to shrink that plant. But then whenever we look at our earlier or more timely applications, okay, you see very little difference between our four and eight ounce rates. They helped us out a little bit, okay, early. And then whenever you look at our 16 and 24 ounce rates, you see very little difference there too, about 21 to 23% high production, okay? Well, some people say the plant can't take up more than 24 ounces to the acre. This one, you know, little piece of data, one year now, keep in mind, shows that you're not getting much more benefit out of 16 ounces, you're getting more benefit out of 24 than you are out of 16, okay? In a timely application, all right? These are just some of the pictures from that study, zero ounces to the acre there on the left. It's taller than our yard stick, right? Don't want that, we missed it, okay? It's too late. 16 ounces to the acre is about 38 inches tall, waist high. Really good cotton, looked good, did well throughout the season. And then 24 ounces to the acre at bloom, same height, waist high, 38 inches tall, okay? That's just to kind of illustrate the point. Like I said, once it gets too tall, it's too late, okay? So just kind of my take home points in terms of variety selection. All the varieties in the variety trial are really good, all right? From top to bottom, we saw only about 150 pounds of land difference, okay? Placement of those varieties is key, right? You know what you need on your place. Putting them in a place where they will be successful is the key to your success, all right? Mixing varieties doesn't seem worth the hassle to me. Thrive on varieties are common. Try them on a limited basis whenever it's your turn. Wide row cotton, not sure there's a fit in Georgia on a broad acre. There might be for some niche type stuff, but not on a broad acre. Looking, I'm going to look at it for one more year, okay? And then PGRs, timeliness is key. Of course, want to thank the Commission and Cotton Incorporated for everything they do. Uh, the Commission is a grower-funded organization, so without you guys, I wouldn't be able to do research like this, okay? Thank our county agents, grower cooperators, industry partners, and all that good stuff. And uh, I can answer any questions now, or we can wait till the end, whatever. I mean, it don't matter. Any quick questions while I'm getting Dr. Snyder's pulled up? Well, good morning, everyone. I'd like to go ahead and, and just get started. And uh, I guess before I really get into my presentation, I'd like to start by thanking all of you for, for showing up today, um, uh, even if it was just because, you know, you, had, you wanted to see Camp's presentation and, you know, I happened to be after him. Um, and then also I would like to thank the Georgia Cotton Commission for all of their support of my program. Uh, they are the, the dominant supporter of my research here in the state of Georgia. And, uh, and I guess what I should do, I guess I should uh, introduce myself. I'm John Snyder. I'm a cotton physiologist here at the University of Georgia. I've been here, um, well, I guess about the last 10 years, somewhere in that neighborhood. Uh, and what I wanted to do, whenever we talk about cotton physiology, it can mean a number of different things. And, and I'm involved in several different types of projects, you know, everything ranging from, you know, nitrogen management, uh, PGR management, uh, water management, and so forth. Uh, but I thought today I want to really focus on some work that I've started recently looking at um, at irrigation and PGR management. And so um, let's go ahead and get started. Now this is not necessarily the year to be talking about drought, I suppose, but I'm still going to I'm going to go ahead and start by talking about drought. Um, <coughs> when we discuss how drought affects yield in cotton, you know, it causes reductions in yield by affecting a lot of different underlying processes. And, and this one picture, again, it doesn't show up as good as I was hoping it would show up, but um, this is a study that we did. This is from 2014. We got pretty severe drought that year. And this is just a transition zone from a fully irrigated part of the field to a dry land part of the field. And so whenever you look at this, there's a few things that come to mind, you know, right away. The first is, one of the first things that's affected under drought stress in almost any crop is growth. That's one of the first things that's affected. And you can see that here. You can see that there's reductions in canopy size. And then what does that do? It, it results in a whole lot of that row middle being exposed to incoming solar radiation. And the reality is if that crop's not there to soak up that 
that solar radiation, then it's not photosynthesizing, it's not being as productive as it could be. Uh, the other thing is that uh, you can see, I want you to notice something here. One major difference between this dry land crop and this irrigated crop. What's something you notice right off the bat? Blooming out the top, right? So it's reaching cut out a lot earlier, okay? Um, so that's one of the things that happens. And, you know, you look at this crop, you don't see those flowers out at the top of the plant. There's still more growth potential there. Um, and so all of these things sort of combine. And I guess the other, yeah, all of these things sort of combine to bring about reductions in yield, okay? The other thing that I didn't mention is those leaves are pretty severely wilted. If they're wilted, they're not photosynthesizing. That also decreases productivity. Now, this is just uh, some quick overview of some work that we've done. And, you know, in a wet year, I just want you, to, I want you to see from treatment one to treatment five. That's just going from the most water to the least, okay, to the dry land. So more stress as we move up in these numbers. So in a wet year, you really don't see a, a response to irrigation necessarily. Um, but in a dry year, you can see substantial reductions. So... In that one in particular, we're seeing almost a two bale yield reduction just because we got drought stress starting right before flowering and extending to peak bloom. That period is particularly uh, sensitive to drought stress, right? The other thing is, if you got excess irrigation, right, you can also produce very rank growth. And sometimes what effect does that have? You've got, you've got a lot of shading lower in the canopy, uh, the plant, of course, doesn't retain that fruit at those lower positions, and you can get later maturity. You might even see yield reductions just because that plant is not retaining the percent of fruit that you would expect it to. Um, and so this is kind of one of the things that we've seen in years where we see yield reductions in response to irrigation. Um, this is just a, an experiment where we had a, a dry land treatment. We had this this 100% evapotranspiration, that's just a recommended irrigation treatment, and then we had an over-irrigated treatment. And I want to show you something here. These plants, and this was in a particularly wet year, you see a positive response, right? We have more biomass, they're bigger plants, um, but one of the things we see is a reduction in harvest index, just meaning that those plants are putting less of their resources into lint yield. So they may be bigger, but they're just putting less of their resources into lint yield. Because harvest index is just a fraction of fiber weight over total biomass. The end result that we got, we actually saw a slight reduction in lint yield. Now it's nothing like the reductions we see in a severe drought stress type of year. But when we start talking about this, you know, obviously if we're going to provide irrigation, we want it to have some benefit, right? And um, sometimes we don't see that, especially in wet years, largely due to, to these uh, rank growth differences. Now, one of the things that those of you who work with cotton are going to be very familiar with is picks, right? We know that if we apply picks, it has certain effects. And of course, it depends on the timing, as we just learned, right? Um, but when we apply picks, what happens? Well, hopefully, you're actually producing a shorter plant. Um, and the other thing that happens is that that plant tends to retain fruit at lower positions on the plant. Now, one of the best plant growth regulators you can have in cotton is good fruit retention, right? That's one of the best growth regulators you can have. And so, if we apply PGRs, what does that do? Well, it produces better fruit retention, it decreases that height, it also, you'll have a plant that will mature earlier. So we know it's sort of the opposite of the effects that we get out of excess irrigation, okay? And so one of the questions I got from some growers and some consultants was that, was can we offset this? Can we offset the effects of excess irrigation by being more aggressive in our picks management strategies? And so starting in, in 2020, I, I had this experiment down at Stripling Irrigation Research Park where I was hoping to answer this question, okay? And of course, we know that response to PGRs is affected by variety. We just heard a little bit about that as well. Um, so this experiment really wanted to take into account the effect of variety, irrigation treatment, and PGR management on growth, yield, and maturity. 
So we had three different irrigation treatments. Uh, we had our recommended rate, we, and we had our over-irrigated rate, and then we had our dry land treatment. We had three PGR treatments. And again, and I mention this every time when I give this presentation, everyone's idea of what constitutes an aggressive PGR management strategy is different, okay? One of the things you heard Camp say is timeliness. You want to get, you want to produce a short cotton plant, timeliness is going to be your most important factor there. So for our, let me just say, we have an untreated control here. We have our moderate treatment. The moderate treatment didn't get an application of picks until flowering, and then it got one more application. It was a, a, one, a 16 ounce application two weeks later. And then we have an aggressive treatment. The only difference here between the moderate and the aggressive is that I added a 10 ounce application at Pinhead Square. So it was a, a early application, okay? We had uh, three cultivars and this is just showing some, uh, you know, some of the, the differences in growth that we got from our PGR treatments. I have data to show you rather than just, I mean, not just the pictures, but this, this really illustrates it. Um, we measured nodes above white flower, and then we used that information. So we measured it repeatedly throughout the season. We used that information to estimate when each plot reached cutout, okay? The days after planting to reach cutout. Uh, we also measured plant height, and then at the end of the year, we got yield and fiber quality. I'll be focusing on yield today. Um, and I guess one of the things I could do here is just mention, you know, this is uh, I don't remember what point in the season this was, but you can see our aggressive treatment here. It's about a, about a yardstick. This one's not a whole lot taller in the moderate, but it's a little bit. These plants, I don't know that it shows it as well, but you know, we're looking at five, six foot tall cotton plants here compared to some of these others. So we did at least do what we sought to do, right? The other thing is, this, this is just showing the design. These are the different PGR treatments, the irrigation treatments. And then nested within each one of those, we had the three varieties, okay? So the results, let's talk about those. Everybody loves an ANOVA table, right? They're like all these numbers just scattered on a table, right? I'm not, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. All this is to say that, um, yeah, we had significant effects on plant height for a number of different treatments. Uh, we had a significant effects for cutout date, depending on the year. And then, of course, lint yield. And this is what I want to talk about. We had a significant effect of irrigation on lint yield for both years. And we had a variety effect in one of those years, okay? I'm not going to talk about the variety effect. You can get variety effects, of course, in these on-farm variety trials. I am going to talk about irrigation, though, because it shows how different these two years were, okay? So for starters, 2020, we typically say, and I know I have this all in centimeters, um, but we say that cotton needs about 46 centimeters during a typical Georgia growing season to maximize yield. So in 2020, at this location, we didn't quite hit that mark. It was a little dry year. In um, 2021, we're way over, right? We got way more water than we could possibly need, okay? If I look at the yields here, what I see is in 2020, the blue bars here, there's a positive response of yield to irrigation. Doesn't matter if it's the the recommended irrigation or the over-irrigated treatment. 2021, it's generally yet lower yielding, but the other thing is that we see yield reductions with irrigation. And it was, an, it was, like I say, it was a wet year. And this is largely because we'll do an irrigation event, and then what happens? We get rainfall at that particular site. Um, <clears throat> so this is two drastically different years. If we look at plant height, again, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. This is just to say that, yeah, when you apply PGRs, you can produce a shorter plant, okay? No shocker there, right? But the effect that you get is a lot larger in irrigated situations than it is in dryland situations, especially in a year where you get drought, um, like, the, like in 2020, okay? So none of that, I think, is terribly surprising. Cutout date, this one I want to spend a little bit of time on because cutout date, there was an interaction between irrigation treatment and um, PGR treatment, all right? So in dry land situations, it did not matter how we managed PGRs, we reached cutout at about the same time, okay? Statistically, reached cutout at the same time under dry land conditions. But when we move to these irrigated treatments, that's where the differences come in, okay? Um, 
we were able, if we applied PGRs, we were able to shorten that season, you know, reach cut out about two to three weeks earlier uh, in those situations, okay? Uh, 2021, we didn't have any interaction with irrigation. Again, it rained all the time, right? So that's going to affect our results a little bit. But all this is really showing is, okay, as you, you use a more aggressive strategy, you see reductions in height. So no shocker. So what are some of the big take-home messages here? Well, the way I see it, you know, in terms of yield, yeah, we're not seeing that inner, we're not able to offset the effects of excess irrigation by applying PGRs, right? Um, if you have excess growth uh, or, or you see reductions in yield in wet years, it's not, we're not able to fix that by applying PGRs, right? But we are able to manipulate the growth and the, the maturity of that plant. That plant will reach cutout earlier by managing PGRs. And of course, that can have a lot of different implications. I mean, if you're, if you're trimming two to three weeks off of the growing season, then that would affect how long you manage irrigation, how long you manage pests, and that type of thing. So, so all of these things are relevant, and of course, it's specific to your particular production scenario. The other thing I'll do is I want to talk a little bit about a PGR management and drought stress study. Um, water loss by the plant is, de is determined by how big those plants are, how fast those plants are growing. A faster growing plant will use more water, okay? Um, so one of the things we wanted to know was how does how we manage PGRs in the early season affect the sensitivity of that crop to drought stress during flowering, okay, during peak bloom in particular, okay? So to address this, we have these large rain exclusion shelters out at the Bowen farm. Uh, the experimental setup, uh, I don't recall the variety name at the, at, at the moment, but I picked one, it was a phytogen variety, but it was one that was that was kind of identified as being responsive to PGRs because I wanted to be able to generate differences in growth. Um, we had two different irrigation treatments. So we had one that stayed well watered all season, one that got drought stress for uh, three weeks starting at peak bloom. And then we had our different PGR treatments. So we had aggressive and no PGRs. We just wanted to generate substantial differences in growth, okay? And uh, this is just showing the layout there. So you, we've got three different rain exclusion shelters there. Um, and, and again, there's several different measurements that we did. We have indicators of growth, and we've got uh, nodes above white flower and that type of thing. And then, of course, soil moisture content. So you can see, you know, are we actually generating some level of drought during, the, during that drought stress period? And then these are some of the end of season measurements, but I'll focus on lint yield today, okay? So what are we doing in terms of growth? Obviously, in the more aggressively treated, we didn't have an effect, we didn't have any interaction between PGRs and irrigation, but we did have, um, which, which is not surprising. Remember, the drought stress was imposed at peak bloom. What did he just tell you about plant growth regulator application? Once you've produced that big plant, I mean, you, you can't shrink it, right? So you, we didn't have interactions there between drought stress and PGR management, but what you can see is we were able to produce substantial differences in growth between our aggressive and untreated plots. Uh, this is just showing fourth internode length, which is a common, you know, common uh, parameter that we use to estimate whether or not we need to apply PGRs. This is showing, you can see that the aggressively treated plots reach cut out earlier. Um, soil moisture, this is showing drought stressed and well watered. You can see significant differences in soil moisture between those treatments as, during our stress period. And then this one, this is what we wanted to know. So these are the trends I kind of expected to see, but we don't have a, a statistical interaction between aggressively treat, I mean, sorry, between PGR treatment and uh, irrigation treatment, okay? But it is showing some of these trends that I was expecting, but the bottom line is we had lower yields with our aggressively managed PGRs. So remember, this is a different location, different variety, so obviously that's going to affect how that crop responds. Um, but what we did is we recognized that from one shelter to the next, we had substantial differences in drought stress. So depending on where you are in the field, just because you said that the plant was under stress for three weeks doesn't mean that it's under yield limiting drought stress at the end. It depends on where we were in the field. So what I did is I plotted the, the average yield for both of those treatments at a given irrigation, I'm uh, sorry, both of the PGR treatments at a given irrigation treatment, okay, versus the actual yield 
of the PGR treated plots. What does this thing tell, tell us? It tells us that PGR treated plots are just more stable, okay, across this range of yield limiting water stress, okay, whereas our untreated plots are much more responsive. So you have, you have higher water status at the end of the stress period, you produce higher yields in the untreated plants. They're able to take advantage of that, grow more, produce more fruiting sites, and so forth. Okay, um, so that's the take home message. We're gonna repeat this again next year. Of course, we, you, know, you don't wanna make any broad conclusions off of one year of data, but that's, that's some of what we've seen. So with that, uh, I'd like to thank you for your time and uh, I'd like to open it up for any questions that you may have.